Be Wealthy and Smart, episode 768. into a world of wealth and financial freedom without budgets, boredom, or bosses on Be Wealthy and Smart. And now, here's your host, Linda P. Jones. Welcome to Be Wealthy and Smart. I'm Linda P. Jones, America's Wealth Mentor, empowering women and men worldwide to financial freedom. On today's show, we're going to talk about the bull and bear case for the stock market. And that's really my description of both sides of possibilities. Is the market going to go up higher? Is the stock market going to go down? What do I see? And what are the points on each side? And also, this is the day that I'm going to reveal who has won 25 prizes. So stay till the end and see if your name is read. So what a crazy year this has been. The stock market has been all over the place. First, making new highs, into early February and then crashing by roughly 35% and now coming back to new all-time highs again. The NASDAQ has been on a tear and technology stocks have just gone through the roof, but it's really just a handful of technology stocks. As I've been reporting through the year, there's about five that make up roughly 23% of the total market cap value of the S&P 500. So it's been a very narrow tech market, if you will. And then we have the S&P 500 back into positive territory again, back at all time highs. And some of those blue chip companies doing well, but others cutting their dividend, having difficult times and shutting stores, laying off employees, definitely dependent on what sector that they're in. And then we have the precious metal sector gone wild, which is where a lot of our alpha comes from this year our amount of return over the index, over the S&P 500 average. Even though metals aren't normally measured by the S&P 500, it's just the general measure that most people look at to see if they're beating the market or not. So the metals have been on a tear and there's a lot going on there that we haven't really talked about on the podcast. So before I go through the bull and bear case, I just want to say for those listeners who have been with me for a long time, or maybe new listeners who are just joining, the reason that I call myself a mentor is not because I'm trying to be the end all be all person that knows everything. That's not what this is about. What this is about is creating a library of knowledge for you to go to, to get free information that educates you because, oh darn, what a coincidence, we weren't taught about finance in school. So this is a place for you to have someone who has real education, real experience in the financial world, and I've built millions in my own net worth. So from my business degree in college to becoming a certified financial planner, that really wasn't the path that taught me about finance. From working in the industry for 25 years, that really wasn't what taught me about finance. It was really my own school of hard knocks, my own trial and error, and from there developing my 28 indicators that I use to help determine what markets are doing is what has made me into a mentor not because I have all the answers, but because I want to teach you how to fish. Because in the end, it's all about learning how to fish. There's people that want to try to tell you the answers and have you go this way or that, but I'd rather tell you why and show you the different choices that you have. And then you see one way is more obvious than the other. One way works more than the other. One way has success for many years more than another. So these are the kinds of things that you learn by listening to Be Wealthy and Smart. It's not about me sitting on high being a guru. It's not about me giving you the answers. 
it's about showing you the way and giving you the empowerment to create your own financial freedom. That's really what it's about. So I just wanted to say that. I don't know why that came into my mind. I know a lot of you have been with me for years and years and you're right on board with that and you're probably shaking your head going, yep, I already know that. That's, uh, yep, I know. (laughs) But there's a lot of people who are newer to the show who might not understand the whole mentorship concept. And just the fact that the backbone of everything we talk about is really investing and compounding your money because ultimately it's not about being frugal. It's not about living below your means so much as it is getting your money to work harder for you and to make more money for you. And that's really how the wealthy become wealthy is by doing just that. It's not by living in the woods. It's not by not spending money. And in fact, I think that's doing a disservice to people to teach that because when I look back on my life, some of the most incredible experiences I've had are while traveling. I can't imagine not allowing myself to have money to travel. And that can be a choice because travel doesn't have to be expensive. But you need to have a balance between allowing yourself the right to live as well as being able to create wealth for yourself. I had a friend who used to say, life is an economic struggle and then you die. And while that's rather cynical, there's a lot of truth to it too. And what he was saying is that he had a very difficult time supporting himself and just earning money. He was an entrepreneur and he never could seem to really pay the bills and get his business going very well. And so it was always a struggle for him and it never seemed to get any easier. And that's because he was focused completely on the income side of the equation and not on the investment side of the equation and getting his money to work harder for him. Now, a lot of people in the FIRE movement are focused on investing. And in fact, that is what is getting them to the point of being able to retire early is they've saved some of their income and then put that money into the market and been able to compound that money. It's not so much the skimping, scrimping, not spending side, although that gave them capital to invest, but it's really the investment and the compounding and having your money work harder for you that is going to get you to financial freedom. So I just, I don't know, there was just some reason that I felt like I needed to reiterate some things that I haven't said for a while. I just wanted to give you that clear message of why we do what we do here and why it's important for you to go back through the podcast library and learn all of the things that are there, starting with why mindset is so important because it is the first step to all wealth. And that's completely left off from Wall Street, from the investment industry, from everything I've ever seen about finance, they leave out mindset. All right, having said all that, let's talk about the market. So first I'm gonna talk about the bear case for the market because there's plenty of people that are very bearish right now. That means they think the market's going to go down, they don't see any reason why the market should be where it is, and they see a total disconnect between the economy and the stock market. And they're not wrong, of course there is a complete disconnect. But what else is going on? Well, besides the narrow market where I said just a handful of companies are really taking the majority of the market capitalization or are responsible for the majority of the market capitalization, we have PE ratios off the charts. When you look at a company like Tesla, selling at a price to earnings ratio of 1170, that means for every $1 of earnings, you're willing to pay $1,170. That's what it means when you buy a share of Tesla stock. And we also have a company like Amazon trading at 131 for its PE. So that means for the next dollar of Amazon earnings, you're willing to pay $131. So you see the PE ratios have really gotten up into the stratosphere. When you look at the average historical PE ratio being about 16. So typically for $1 of earnings, historically you would pay $16. You can see how the market is so crazily expensive. These PE ratios, I remember back in the days from 2000, and that's when we had 
a disconnect like this. We had technology companies gone wild and we had high PE ratios and it had nothing to do with what was happening in the economy. In fact, there were many signs that the economy was slowing down, but yet technologies just kept going and going and going. We also don't have the full economy even open again. So while the stock market is at these highs, we're not even able to function normally. And that means lots of businesses are struggling. Maybe some can't even open, or maybe some are going bankrupt right now. So there's a disconnect with the reality of businesses versus publicly traded companies. And then we have the new numbers of a million people recently filing for unemployment a huge number. And again, that total disconnect. We have the Fed in their money printing phase and now talking about accepting more inflation or higher inflation rates. And we have about 27% of all mortgages in forbearance. So people having not paid their mortgage for several months and maybe not able to pay their mortgage for several months, yet we have the housing market at highs and many prices of houses at highs and new construction at all-time highs. And those people that remember 2000 probably are looking back and saying, yeah, and what happened in 2001 and 2002? Technology declined by 75% over the next two years. And that might be where we're headed, we'll see. Now let's talk about the bull case for the market. We've talked about how the market is in a rotation and how many companies are still very undervalued. Because a handful of companies have been getting all the assets and all the investment money, there are a lot of smaller companies that are rebounding nicely that are still selling at a hefty discount. Secondly, we're in a high momentum market. So we have some companies making new highs, we just have a lot of momentum going, and we have low interest rates, interest rates near zero. We have a lot of money sloshing around out there from the Fed's quantitative easing. So that's propelling money to go into the stock market and drive it to new highs. We have that unprecedented stimulus of $8 trillion happening. And we may be looking at a second stimulus coming. I'm also of the opinion that out there somewhere is a debt jubilee for our country and for the world because we are $121 trillion in debt. When you look at derivatives in banks, we're looking in terms of dollar amounts in the quadrillions. These are things that can never be paid off in multiple generations. This must result in some form of a debt jubilee, in my opinion. And that means forgiveness of all debt, mortgages, credit cards, school loans, auto loans, etc. And when that debt jubilee happens, that should be a propellant for the market. That should make more sense to us as to why the market's higher. Number five, our dollar's been getting weaker. So a weaker dollar means that the stock market generally goes up. A lot of foreign money pours into our market when the dollar's weaker, they can buy more. So that tends to propel the stock market higher. Number six, this is an election year and that's not a small thing. Elections tend to run on a four year cycle. We are in the fourth year of that cycle, which is the second best performing year of all four years. And it's a pretty well-proven cycle. And even after a sharp dip early in the year, there's usually an 85% chance that the market comes back with a positive return after that. And that's exactly what we're seeing right now. So what is my target that I'm seeing for the stock market? I'd say the S&P 500 will probably reach 3,800. We have higher to go. That doesn't mean we won't have some sharp pullbacks along the way. I am anticipating one point before the year end where we see a pretty sharp pullback. And I'm also seeing where commercial real estate can be a serious problem, where interest rates can spike, and where we also can go to negative interest rates in the banking system. So all of this craziness is still out there yet to come in the last quarter of the year. So it's gonna be a rock and roll quarter in my opinion. We're gonna see a lot of things that we haven't seen before and it's going to be a bit 
crazy. But then again, this is the year 2020 of that 2020 vision, and we are having craziness all throughout this year. That's what this entire year has been about, is ups and downs and craziness and unexpected things. So I just think there's more of that ahead. I also think that in regard to silver and gold, we have some specific things going down that I've been looking at and waiting for for years and years and years. And for anyone who's owned the metals for several years and you're thinking, oh, when it gets back to even, I'm gonna sell, you are making a horrible mistake in my opinion. This metals market, while it did go to match the all-time highs in 2011 and it's been on a pullback since then, the reason why we own physical silver and gold is for times like right now, times when the Federal Reserve is creating trillions of dollars of money and debasing the currency. That's the main reason why we have owned gold and silver. And this started really back in 2008. That's when they started the quantitative easing program. And so this has been going on and on and on, but now has escalated to a greater degree. And that means the people that have been buying the contracts for gold and silver to take physical delivery have been taking physical delivery. They've been wanting to get their physical gold and silver. And because more people have been taking physical delivery in these contracts, it's getting more and more difficult to deliver the physical silver. Remember, when COVID started, a lot of silver and gold mines shut down. So they haven't been operating. And where are they going to get that physical silver and gold in order to deliver on those contracts? Well, maybe they're not. And if they don't have the physical to deliver, that's called a force majeure. That means it's an act of God that they could not deliver the physical and those contracts get settled in cash. But once that's broken, once that system doesn't work and the contracts that you purchase to get physical silver are not reliable for you to get your physical silver, it's game over. And that means that physical silver and gold can skyrocket to whatever the market price is to pay people who can deliver physical gold and silver. And that is why we've owned silver for so long in particular, because silver has been artificially suppressed in terms of price for a very long time so that it wouldn't compete with the dollar, so that it wouldn't compete with fiat currency. And now if that physical silver is not available to be delivered, that is going to be like pushing a ball under water and letting go and the ball pops into the air and it's going to pop as high as the supply and demand will determine. So we don't know what that is, but I can tell you just based on inflation adjusted prices, when we look at $50 silver from 1980, that inflation adjusted price using John Williams from Shadow Stats real inflation index, which is how they used to calculate it before they took out food and energy. When you use the real inflation index that used to be used for years, that puts the price of silver at a $600 inflation adjusted price to equal what $50 silver was in 1980. Now I'm not predicting that silver is gonna get to $600 this year. I can't possibly predict that. But what I can say is that that number is probably in our future somewhere. Maybe not this year, maybe not even next year but it's worth it if you can still pick it up below $30 and possibly it goes back to its all-time high from 1980. If it goes back to that high and that high is $600 today, then going on to new highs from there shouldn't be that difficult. So we'll see what happens. Again, please don't take it as a prediction. All I'm saying is I'm comparing inflation adjusted numbers from the past. But isn't that an interesting example? And isn't this the exact reason why 
we have invested in precious metals. Yes, it is. So the fact that silver is up 100% from the low this year, or the fact that our mining stocks are up over 40% year to date and is trouncing NASDAQ and is trouncing the S&P 500, well, those are all great things. But it's because we're in this particular time frame of what's going on with creating more fiat dollars, let alone civil unrest and all the other things that are going on, I mean, that's all positive for metals too, but I'm just strictly looking at the amount of dollars in existence. And since the amount of dollars in existence has been so dramatically increased by the Fed this year, that is why we've wanted to own gold and silver. So if you haven't yet gotten silver in your possession, this is the time to do it. I know the premiums are outrageous, and that means that it's a lot over spot price, that you have to pay to get one physical silver coin. And the reason for that is because it's so difficult to get physical silver, which is why we need to get it. Because you can't trust the contracts. You can't trust SLV or GLD. Do not invest in those. And if you're in them, I recommend you get out of them immediately. Get something like PSLV, which is physical silver. That's the Sprott Physical Silver Fund which has physical silver in it. That way you know that you have the physical there. Otherwise, if a contract gets busted and they don't deliver, you're not gonna participate in that spiking price. So you've got to have the physical silver in order to benefit from any price adjustment that may happen if they can't deliver physical silver on these contracts. So I hope I made that clear to you. This is a particular point in time, a unique point in time that likely will only happen once in our lifetime. So this is again, (laughs) indicative of 2020 and what we're experiencing this year, but it's the reason why we've owned silver for all this time. All right, now is the time I'd like to announce our winners. And first, I just wanna thank everyone who wrote a podcast review and who wrote a book review. I am so grateful that you wrote these reviews and took the time to say a word about the podcast. I learned so much about what you think about the podcast, what you like about it, and I receive all of your lovely things that you said uh, in regard to my teachings, things you've learned from me, how you have been advancing in your own knowledge, and that is the whole point. So that makes me feel very grateful to you for being a listener and for being here all this time. So thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who did that. And now I'd like to read the 10 winners who won You're Already a Wealth Heiress, my book, which was named to the list of all-time wealth books by Book Authority. And I'm happy to mail these out to you. All you need to do is contact me by email at lpjhome at gmail.com and put a book winner in the subject line and let me know what, what address to mail it to. So our first winner is Richard Howes, H-O-W-E-S. Our second winner is The Rookie Investor. The third winner of the book is T Mecca, T, capital T, capital M, E-K-A. Number four is Judy T.C. Amber. So Judy, capital T, capital C, capital A, M-B-E-R. The fifth winner of the book is Blue Angelic, B-L-U-E-A-N-G-E-L-I-K. Number six is She Sees Sees. It's S-H-E-S-E-E-S-S-E-A-S. Number seven, Fit Mama 09. Number eight, Arrow Watcher. Number nine, Jessa Joy, J-E-S-S-A-J-O-Y. And number 10, K-S-L-O-1, or K-S-L-O-W-E-L. All right, congratulations to all the book winners. And now the winners of my Wealthy Mindset Blueprint audio sets valued at $197. These are digital audios. And so when you notify me that you've won, I can email these out to you for immediate listening. Number one is Ginny, G-I-N-N-Y. Number two is Lisa Marie Bailu. That's 
Lisa Marie, last name B-E-A-U-L-I-E-U. Number three is I, Jemina, I, capital G-I-M-E-N-A. Number four is Ashley Jenkins. Number five, Cove Tech, that's C-O-V, capital T-E-C-H. Number six is Adnan Michael, Adnan and then M-I-K-H-A-E-L. Number seven is Preston Millsap. Number eight is Steve N. Number nine is Betsy Short. And number 10 is Joseph S. Wright. Thank you all for your podcast reviews or book reviews. And if you email me at lpjhome at gmail.com, I will see that you get your Wealthy Mindset Blueprint audio sets. And finally, five people will win 30-minute one-on-one wealth mentoring sessions with me. This is not specific investment advice, but it is general investment advice where we can talk about different topics. We can talk about the pros and cons of ideas that you have, and I can give you my opinion. Number one, Monica Ludecki. It's L-U-E-D-E-C-K-E. Number two, Deandra. And then she has a less than three, which is a heart symbol, Um, Deandra. Number three, LMB385. Number four, Miss Fantasia. And number five, Kilopass, K-I-L-L-A-P-S-S. You've all won 30-minute wealth mentoring sessions with me. All you need to do is email me at lpjhome at gmail.com and put wealth mentoring in the subject line and we'll set up a time for us to talk. All right. Well, again, thank you everyone who left reviews, podcast reviews, book reviews. Thank you so much. I love the feedback on your already wealth heiress. I love that men love the book as well and that you've learned so much that you've been able to put into action. I think particularly right now because of COVID and everything that people are going through, all the different financial struggles that people are feeling, that this gives you a good guide to know what to do, to know what steps to take, to give you a plan, to give you direction, and to show you how to overcome any obstacles that you're having right now, any hardships, any limitations, any blocks. This book will help you with all of that. So if you haven't checked out the Wealth Heiress book, go on over to Amazon or amazon.uk and get your millionaire action plan. That's all for today. Until next time, live the good life and be wealthy and smart. Thank you for listening to Be Wealthy and Smart with Linda P. Jones. Share the wealth and tell your family and friends about the show. Check out our website, blog, and social media for more riches at www.bewealthyandsmart.com.